guys. Welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. Shrek here, the host of these interviews with legends from all over the planet. Today, it's a 421,000 subscriber YouTube channel, Rocket Kit, and we get down and dirty discussing all the tips and tricks to grow your own YouTube channel. But if you're not into YouTube or growing your own YouTube channel, you're still going to enjoy this because we just talk about the lifestyle of spearfishing that we all know and love. Before we get there, a couple of quick shout outs. The Palapas Ventana crew, the Blue Water World Cup is just about to start. It's just around the corner. And uh, it's probably one of the most well-regarded, well-supported competitions in the world. It's a Blue Water comp, uh, chasing awesome fish, uh, really well um, supported, as I mentioned, in terms of the boats and the accommodation and the food, meeting great people. And as well as that, they've now got some packages that can go with it. You can um, stay on the shoulder of the competition and get out and do all sorts of stuff. You can recon the comp if you want. Um, fantastic comp, very well regarded, guys. Palapasventana.com for more information. Or if you just type in Blue Water World Cup, uh, cool, guys. And if you go back, you can listen to our interview there a couple of weeks back. But um, also, I had a review for the podcast. You know how I feel about reviews. Uh, Shepard Kelleher said, Hey Shrek, I love to listen to the podcast when I'm not in the water. I love listening to what all the guests have to say about spearfishing. So thanks for that, Shepard. Um, guys, check out the Blue Water World Cup. It's mad. And today, go to Rocket Kit on YouTube and make sure you subscribe as well. Join 421,000 others. I have one more quick shout out before I get there. And that is Ed Martin from Killshot Spear Guns in the Florida Keys. He's running free diving and spearfishing courses. He'll re-rug, re rug, re rug, re rug. Let's go with re-rig your spear guns. So check it out at killshotspearguns.com. He is an Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys. He's a top man. Been sponsoring the podcast for a while now. Caught up with him this morning and as usual, full of froth. Check it out, killshotspearguns.com. Here we go. Let's get into today's interview. Rodney Pasetti from Rocket Kit. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it. We trust it and dive it. Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. Adreno.com.au, the home of recipes, blogs, videos, equipment reviews, and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you. Not only that, but spearfishing trips and courses, courses and trips that I sometimes get to go on. Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out, and if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. G'day, guys. Today I'm joined by Rodney Pasidi, aka Rocket, on YouTube. Um, Craig Brown, one of the patrons of the New Spiro podcast, requested uh, Rod come on. He told me about his YouTube channel, said he, it's bloody awesome and he's a great guy. Um, check out his Instagram and he, and he linked it up and sent it over to me. I went on a little bit of an investigation and I found out that Rod has got a very successful YouTube channel, actually. He's got uh, 419,000 subscribers, and uh, you're making pretty, like, cool videos, Rod. So well done on your success, and welcome to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, cheers, cheers, yeah. No, it's a, it's sort of been a, a weird kind of journey, and I just sort of kind of got lucky after just mucking around. I was basically just started uploading videos for mates, you know what I mean? And it sort of just snowballed slowly over time, and then all of a sudden, I don't know, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. And mate, you're killing it! Like, um, you know, uh, you updated, a, uh, uploaded a video six days ago. It's got thirty thousand views. Thirteen days ago, it's forty five thousand views. Like, some of your videos have done, you know, a lot more than that. You've had a million plus on it. Several of you of your videos. Um, well done on your success. And sometimes I accuse, accuse YouTube of gaming the algorithm a little bit. But obviously, yeah. regular people are still able to find success on YouTube. So, um. Talk, how long have you been doing the yeah. YouTube channel for? Uh, oh, God. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the time it sort of all took off, but oh, like let's say maybe even eight eight years ago. Like okay. I think I uploaded my first video, but it was there was no there was no intention of turning it into a channel at that stage. It was sort of 
like even the name like Rocket Kit came because like it was I just put that name on because I had a graphic design business and I needed I needed somewhere to just look at videos and like things and and stuff like that so I just threw up my business name at the time and then um then I think I moved up to the Gold Coast and I'd sort of stopped I hadn't been doing a lot of fishing and things like that and I moved up to the Gold Coast and I wanted to get back into spearfishing and I really struggled to sort of find uh, a couple of places um, to, to spear up here because, like, back yeah. when I was younger, you know, you could go anywhere in Sydney yeah. where I grew up. It was just like, you know, the whole place is like sandstone, like yeah. everywhere, you know what I mean, <laughs> and rocks and holes and, like, anywhere you could jump in off the shore because I didn't have a boat. And then I saw these guys sitting up and I'd just come back in from Kingscliff, which was one of the few places I could leave on that south side and just swim out. Mm. And um, I remember just looking up at one point and going, oh, this is ridiculous. Like I was, you know, like half a K or something out, out yeah. there to me. And I looked up and I looked at the show and I went, this is silly. And I was by myself as well because I didn't really know anyone up here. Yeah. And I got in and I found um, some guys sitting up in a kayak and they were going to go out and jump in as well. And I was like, a kayak? Why don't I, why don't I get one of them? You know what I mean? That, yeah. Like I couldn't believe I hadn't even thought of it. Like, so I, I went and got like a cheap BCF kayak. And then, uh, sorry, this is going to actually do full loop back to, as to back to the Perfect. videos in Love YouTube. It. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think I got the a cheap, like it, so it was like 329 bucks, paddled it out, uh, and I was living at Burley at the time. So I saw that there was like a reef just out from where I was living, which was Palm Beach Reef. Palm Beach Reef, yep. Yeah. So I paddled out there just for a test run, had like a little rod and reel set up, and then a slightly bigger, like I think it was like 4,000 was my biggest uh, reel set up. Paddled out there, saw guys like catching mackerel. It must have been it must have been the peak of summer season because oh, I yeah. I got out there. I'd had a very quick look on uh, online about how to get like a wire rig. I've never used wire to rig before. Like threw the line out and I got like my first spotty like straight off the bat. Oh, and I was like, oh my god, this is the best thing ever. And then that that sort of kicked off the kayak fishing. And then I was sort of hooked on kayak fishing from that point on. And then I just. Uh, needed somewhere because I was looking at all the forums to get details of any kind of rig or anything to sort of maximize catching some of these mackerel. Mm. And I remember seeing um, uh, like a joining, I think it was called AKF. I'm not even sure if it's around anymore, but uh, one of the forums that I went on, uh, they, there was just a bunch of people starting to upload videos. Australian so, kayak forum, I'm assuming. I think it was Australian kayak fishing forum okay. or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I just, I was like hooked on that, started uploading. I just wanted to write trip reports because everyone was doing trip reports. And then I, and then I saw, well, the people are uploading videos of their trip as well. And I always wanted to, cause I was a graphic designer at the time. Uh, I really wanted to upload a video and just try my hand at video editing. And it finally had a reason to do it. Yeah. So I had the software right there. So started uploading on the YouTube channel just so I could embed it into the forum. Like oh, I had no nice. intention of turning it. Yeah. So sorry, that, that was a long way around, wasn't it? No, nah, man, um, like I, I, <laughs> for me personally, like I am uh, like, uh, how would you put my level of line fishing prowess? Um, I don't know, down, way down the bottom. Like uh, there's five-year-old kids that make me look uh, bad. That, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in New Zealand, I did have a brief foray into helping a mate set up a kayak fishing business, and we would catch like three or four kilo snapper um, off off a Wongaman tarp and um, on a kayak. And man, that is a lot of fun. Like it's highly addictive. It's probably the next best thing to spear fishing, if you like, you know, any form of fishing. I personally think because like a, a four kilo fish will actually pull you around in the kayak, as you probably know. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. There's something, there's definitely something about it. Like I, you know, I, before that, before the kayak there, like I'd mucked around on kayaks before, but I'd never done like serious kayak fishing. And yeah. then once I got up here, like I couldn't believe like the things you could catch, like any, anything was on the, on the tape plate. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, especially catching a mackerel know. your first time out. Like that'd be awesome. Yeah. That'd be addictive. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And then I, and then I remember going up to Noosa and seeing a guy pulling in like a monster Spanish and just, oh, wow. and then I met a few guys down here as well. And then, and then it was on and then I, you know what I mean? I was right into the kayak fishing, which is weird because originally I wanted, I was trying to spearfish up here and I was struggling basically. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> but, oh, uh, yeah. Southern Queensland, eh? honestly, for, for learning spearfishing, this is partly where the passion for the podcast comes from. Like there's, there are so few places to go that are shore based with decent visibility. Nothing has got consistent good visibility. 
the the few and far between spots that are available are notoriously um, difficult conditions like Kingscliff. You get ripping mm. current through there. It's a long swim. You're dealing with swell. You, it's quite sharky yeah. out there at times. It's yeah. a very sketchy place to go spearfishing, particularly by yourself. And um, mm. and that's one of the popular sort of spots in this area, you know? Yeah, well, it's only one of a, yeah, like you said, a handful that you can actually go to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can go from shore. That's the key, isn't it? Getting, off, getting from the shore out there, that's the tricky part, yeah. So did you start diving off your kayak soon after that or – had it. No, no. Like, well, yeah. Like, so growing up, like I, I like grew up spearfishing, like just bread and butter kind of stuff, you know, mm. like um, brim, yeah, brim, Blackfish. brim, literic, yeah. you know, drummer, yeah. buddies, yeah. like leather jacket, all that kind of stuff, like yeah. squid, all, all in Sydney Harbour, basically. Or sometimes we go out, you know, off Maroubra or Little Bay and places like that. Yeah. But most of the time, it was inshore, you know, and and I was I was doing lots and lots of that all growing up, and like we like. That was the main thing. I probably I fished as well, but probably did more spear fishing. And my dad was more of a spear fisher, but it, like, we mixed it up a bit of a half half kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But then once I moved up here, and just I think just getting a few mackerel under my belt and realizing just how good it could be on the kayak, and realizing how hard it was to find a good place to go offshore without or from the shore. Yeah. I think uh, I did, like, kayak fishing just took over from that point on. And, I, and then I was just focusing on that for, for quite a while. So I never even, I, like, I think I've probably jumped in offshore like maybe twice off the kayak oh, since. Wow. And, and that includes up till now, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. But now it's changed a lot, I guess, because I've I'm, I'm got a little inflatable and I've been going, you know, up to the islands and things like that, which is yeah. which I never thought I'd ever be able to do. So talk idea. about that. Talk about that. Where did the inspiration come for that? Because it's, um, you know, like it's, where are you driving to? Yamba. Uh, well, a lot of times, yeah, oh, or up, up, like anywhere from basically, well, let's say about seventeen seventy or Gladstone area, anywhere from there upwards, basically. And there's yeah. plenty of islands. Like I, like in, you know, when you're a kid, you dream of that kind of thing, like yeah. just going to an island, camping on it by yourself. But it's it's never in my mind. It never really was that achievable. Yeah. In Sydney, there's just not there's just not that kind of structure. There's not that kind of thing around. Yeah. And then when I got up to um, Queensland, like like I heard murmurs of it, but like I didn't really know much about it even up here for for a couple of years. And then a few people, like in the kayak world, a few people sort of mentioned. They said you should take the kayak up and do maybe a camp out at a few other places. Like I think Stanich Bay was one of the ones that was mentioned first, and then the the Keppel was another one that got mentioned and thrown mm-hmm. around. So eventually, like I, I started planning this trip. And it took a while. It took a while for me to get my head around it. And I thought, oh, that's right. And I think I had this uh, skiff arrive. Uh, the guys who made the kayak that I'm on now, they made this skiff as well, which is basically, it was basically like a sort of a giant sup with an outboard on it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and that sort of opened up the possibility to get out of the islands, out to the islands with our, without anyone dropping me off or something. Wow. And then, um, yeah, so I, I got on the skiff, got it all kitted up, and then, it took a little while, but I headed out to like an island that was probably about, oh, probably about thirteen k's out offshore. And, um, yeah, <laughs> that's freaking and awesome. And, uh, and you yeah, did that solo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, it all that's seems freaking to be solo. Man. Like I don't know why. Like um, it seems to work better on the YouTube channel. But oh, it's not like I planned to do it solo. It's just yeah. I think maybe my craft, a very solo craft, maybe that's dictated a little bit. But yeah. <laughs> But um, well, there's an yeah, appe- there's an a- there and- there's an appeal I think to the lifestyle, you know, like the adventurous sort of spearfishing, fishing, hunter type lifestyle. That there is this kind of the solo allure to it all, I think. And maybe yeah. maybe you've managed to capture that in your videos and kind of tap into some of that that desire. Yeah. From I think there's a lot of people that just want to get away from the hustle and bustle and get back to some simple sort of primitive lifestyle. Maybe maybe you've tapped into that. No, absolutely. And it, yeah, because that's it. Originally, it starts off as, yeah, a pursuit to get away from it, isn't it? Get away from it all, get away from the crazy, the rules and the, and the people. Yeah. But now, but now I do find myself, well, you know, maybe it's the kids as well. Maybe I do find myself wanting to involve <laughs> them more and want more people with me as well. But if that's that brings another challenge in filming with kids or with other friends, even. Yeah. I've noticed it's a big, it's a big difference. Like, I tend to start. I start focusing on them and talking to them, and I stop talking to the camera and talking to the audience. And I, I find that some, can sometimes be an issue as well because I get back home and I realise I've just got a uh, 
like SD card full of just me chatting to a mate instead of actually putting a video together kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot. Like for me, I don't have the bandwidth to do multitasking. I'll be real honest. Like I'm a hardcore monotasker. So even when I go spearfishing and I try and make a video, I find it very distracting and very demanding. And it's pretty much the opposite of what I want from a day out spearfishing. So a lot of the time, I just take my GoPro and I just leave it in my dive bag. And then, you know, the few times it comes out, it's like, I I just like, it'll be shit biz or something like that, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. So how do you, how do you, when you go out and you do these solo missions, how do you just sort of have, you know, like have the focus and energy to think and plan and be strategic about what it is you're doing? Well, yeah, I think, I think what, well, in the beginning, I guess I, I was trying to plan it out, but I think it very quickly became obvious to me that because I'm doing it solo and because I want to try and go and I want to follow, like I guess a lot of my videos really follow exactly what happened. Like I think, say, you look at other people's channels and they sort of, they might tell a story or they might sort of jump from here to there. And um, But what I like to do is try to have it kind of linear from the point I left all the way through to the end of the trip kind of oh, thing. Yeah. So, so. And then it, it seems to be becoming more and more apparent the more I do it that is, the trip sort of dictates the order of what which I do things. And as long as I'm filming and capturing actually what happened, and that, I think that's what this first person kind of view, uh, uh, kind of camera angle and everything that I'm focused on, I think it sort of uh, sort of all just falls into place whether I like it or not, really. <laughs> but uh, as long as it, it's just about being. Um, uh, just making sure I get the footage, you know what I mean? Because sometimes you get lazy and you skip bits and then you realise when you get home that you, if you didn't get every little part of it, you can't join all the parts together and you can't really tell the story. Yeah, so I've just got to be really aware and um, and, and, prop, and make sure I properly catch each each moment so I can join all those parts together, even if it's something as simple as uh, when I get to the beach and I walk up the beach I've got to get some footage of me getting from point A to point B otherwise I just can't I can't like otherwise I'm jumping around everywhere and it doesn't make sense yeah. it's, it's it's clever b-roll do you ever cheat cheat yeah like uh, so no. like so you'll I, use transitions from older trips to <laughs> help you tell the story better in a, in a current video uh, I'm, I, I'm really I really 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 believe in not cheating so yeah, nice. I, I try not to cheat ever. There, there may be one or two instances when I've, when I've, like I've just gone, wow, I just don't have a shot of me walking. You know, like it could be something simple, like walking from here to there in, on the beach, and I may have slipped a little bit in. But typically, no, no cheating. Wow, I think it's kind of a rule. I don't want to. I don't want to. Oh, this is going to be. Yeah, how do I talk, talk about this one? I think what I, what I like about YouTube has always been that it's just a regular guy. He's not fancy. He's not like the TV shows. He's not like all the guys trying to create like this amazing super polished story. What I liked about it was just regular guys like you and me going out and fishing and filming it. And it's nice to make it polished and look good, but it still has to be what really happened in my yeah. books. So that's a, even I, I even struggle sometimes, say, if I say a lot of guys will put the camera down and then walk past it and you can tell that they're it's not really what happened. They're basically reenacting them walking past that section of, of land. Yeah. So they, they cease to, it ceases to become the real footage and, and all of a sudden it becomes acting. Yeah. And then, yeah. And so I, I even struggle with that kind of thing, like say setting up a shot and then say walking through it. Cause I can tell a lot of the time when someone's re reacting that shot. And so I try to avoid those shots altogether as well. Like I might set up a camera and just have it rolling Mm. And then go fishing, and then come what may. Yeah. But I'll, I'll very rarely try and set up a shot. I, I like it to sort of be as it happened. Man, but, I, yeah. I, I'm mm. listening to you, and I'm remembering when I've tried to shoot videos. And I tell you what, I'm a shit actor, and I think most Spiros are. <laughs> Me like, too. Yeah. And yeah. and I actually <laughs> detest it because it, it it feels disingenuous. It feels fake, and. Yeah. I'm not good at it and it, there's almost like this cringy feeling inside me when I do it and I will do yeah, it. Yeah. I will do it, we, we, you know, to tell a good story. But it you doesn't sort of do it sometimes. It, yeah. does, it doesn't feel good though. Like I think yeah. sometimes there's an aspect to make, making a video sometimes that does feel a little bit cringy. Um, mm. It's good you've found your Absolutely. own sort of way to, <laughs> to navigate that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the only way to navigate it, 
for the majority of the filming is just to have the camera on me and I, I turn the camera on and I, I try and do the stuff I was meant to do. And if it works out, fantastic. And if it doesn't, then that's also captured. And then, cause if, yeah, like a lot of my videos will have a lot of, uh, well, all the things in a trip that go wrong, they're usually also included. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? And sometimes it's embarrassing, but most, most of the time I'll, I'm happy to include it cause that's yeah. kind of, it's kind of what really happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're people like, I, I like, I, I've like, I don't know if you've, seen any of my terrible attempts at videos but like i've left in all the bungles i personally think they're the best parts of the videos and i'm laughing at my own self so exactly yeah yeah and (laughs) like daniel man and i talk talk a wee bit and i i quite like daniel i love his videos um i listened to one of the podcasts recently actually yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) um you know and he 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 says he models a lot of his stuff off casey neistat and he and he credits a few other bigger youtubes I went and watched some Casey Neistat videos a while ago, and I tell you what, that's some of the best viewing I've done for a long time. Like, it's honestly ten minutes of entertainment, and the transitions are beautiful, um, and you can see why people watch it. And even though sometimes he doesn't even seem to do much, it's just a very compelling, yeah. interesting short video, which is great, and um, it, it's very entertaining. Are there any people that you've kind of modelled? your style after or have you borrowed ideas from things like that yeah like yeah well well when you mention casey like that that channel's like that that's the that, that's the pinnacle that's the special like that's the gold standard isn't it yeah but um people like i guess originally when i was really starting out i definitely watched things like casey neistat and i tried just to get an idea of how he's putting these stories together and and the well, the idea of a vlog, and I think it's very different to a show or something like that. A lot of people are trying to make shows now, and I don't, I don't want to make a show. I want it to be a vlog, and I want it to be, yeah, like warts and all. It's just like, oh, this is a tough one to explain. A lot of the guys I watch, some of them are more polished, but what I liked about Casey and a lot, and a lot of the other fishing guys, like another guy I liked was John B., the guy in the U.S., one of the Googans, and people like that because it was a vlog and it showed just everyday life, uh, the lead up to the trip as much as the actual trip. And a lot of the time he could just be sitting there talking or just explaining what was going to happen. And it was just as interesting because I, I ceased to be just checking in to see him catch big fish or see Casey do something amazing, like with a drone, like flying around on a drone or something. And I was just tuning in just to catch up with him and see what's going on this yeah. week, you know, or just just checking in. It's like watching Neighbours, like a soap opera. You can't help but want to check in and just see what they what it, what they're up to this week, more than uh, more than it being so, like a, an amazing movie or an epic kind of event every every video because it's unsustainable if you need an epic event yeah. every video as well. Yeah. That's the problem as well. So I try to I wanted it to be like a vlog that um, that was an ongoing like a real like a video log rather than a show with like. It just basically was something that everyone could check in on. But I don't, I don't know. Then I worried that I didn't have that kind of personality. There was lots of things, that, teething problems about this because all the guys that seemed to be redo, redoing really well were really over the top or ocker or like had big or just not ocker, not not in a bad way. In a good yeah, way, yeah, but, I get it. But they were really they had big personalities, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily the big personality or the you know the run up the beach yelling kind of guy. I'm I'm the more chilled, grown up guy that just wants to go and catch fish and doesn't you know carry on when i'm catching them and stuff like that <laughs> as much as i'm enjoying myself i don't yeah i don't sort of go all nuts <laughs> mm. there is a disconnect between youtubers and who they are in real life but i think mm. every, any form of entertainment is like that like when i when i record a podcast it's a form of entertainment i have to be engaging i have to be engaged and i have to be curious that's my job as an interviewer you know i think as a youtuber it's your job to be charismatic entertaining and enthusiastic like that passion is contagious and people love that sometimes you know like it's almost like you 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 want to be consistent with who you are though but there is a layer of performance if you're creating a a form of media for anyone i think sure yeah no for sure i yeah yeah. i was gonna say i met the back to basics boys and um yep i like them eat even more in real life. Like they are just genuinely super awesome, intelligent, well-intentioned, just really nice, solid, soul of the earth guys. I went diving with them. Sure. Some of the best diving, like in terms of fun and the, the system we worked, 
that I've had for a long time. Like just just yeah, genuinely yeah. good dudes, and that's what you want. Um, I didn't expect yeah. them to be entertaining the whole time, um, like they are on the YouTube <laughs> yeah. channel, because it's just real life, you know. Like, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I'd like to meet those guys actually. Like, they've yeah. done some pretty cool trips recently as well. Yeah. You'd get on good with them, man. Um, <laughs> in terms of gaming the system, like um, a lot of yes, I, I see a lot of like really talented Spiros. Um, they make good videos. They make great videos, even. But mm. there's there are some. There are some things that YouTube does. Um, let's not talk about any of the nefarious stuff. Let's just talk about the positive stuff. But the way yep. they rank and sort channels so that videos get prioritized over other videos is not really yep. clear. There's a bit of secret source to it. Um, it looks like you've tuned it up a little bit, but I don't see over the top like thumbnails where you're guaranteeing like, you know, like some, some yeah. of the cornier yep. channels yep. and stuff. Yours just looks like a vlog, and but it look it's very interesting and engaging, and there's a variety of color, and you've captured some of the landscapes and the exciting things you've done. But ha- walk us through some of the the tips and tricks that you use to make your videos rank. Ooh, yeah, this is a this is the big question, isn't it? Because I, I think like it, it's it's definitely one of those things. Like thumbnail and title is definitely God in this in this world these yeah. days, but um. It's a, it's really hard to sort of find uh, that like the your niche and what really works. Like I got lucky once, uh, and yeah, and I, I I definitely try and avoid like uh, my thumbnails. That I've kind of got a rule that like I don't I don't want to I know I don't Photoshop elements in. Like I'll Photoshop. Obviously, my images are photoshopped, like and to make them look better and to maybe you know emphasize certain things. But I don't I won't bring in like something that didn't actually happen. Like that the actual shot is actually something that I set up you know, physically. So like, so even those, uh, so when you know, there's obviously a thumbnail that turns up a lot, which is that knife and the meat in hand in like in a first person view. Yeah. Yeah. And I got, I caught onto that one because I, uh, well, that video, that's probably the first video that propelled the channel up. Like I had this video and I thought it was a lovely thumbnail that I put up. It was like a coral trout. And I, I, you know, I was standing in front of the boat and I, I was just framing it. I thought, this is going to be great. This video is going to be awesome. And it just did nothing. And like, I, but like everything analytics wise, because they give you every stat under the sun. And I was looking at it, I was like, everything's suggesting that that video should do better. But it, it's just, people just aren't clicking it because I could see the impressions were there. Everything was there. Everything added up to it being a great video. I was like, it must be the thumbnail. So I changed, I, I had, like on a whim, I just had the knife in one hand, I had the fillets in another, and uh, the tent was in front of me. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take a little click of that. That sort of looks like a cool little shot. Yeah. And it was that was the the birth of the knife and meat in hand thumbnail. <laughs> 3.9 million I, I, views that's got, 3.9 yeah, million. and I uploaded that first one and, uh, and I, I thought, and I changed it. So it took about a, maybe a month and that video just hadn't done it, or maybe a few weeks at least. And it hadn't done anything. And I thought sometimes you can get an extra second, a second run if you just change the thumbnail and title. So I put that like knife in hand kind of a thumbnail up and it just started going up and up and up. And next thing you knew, I I checked back on it. It was like, it was cranking over like a 10,000 views an hour or something at one point. I was like, oh, holy smokes. And then, and then just when it really started to go off and it was really cranking uh, everyone got locked down. It was COVID. <laughs> and everyone, got, <laughs> everyone got locked down like that timing. week. And it was like, I guess it was just like the perfect storm. And uh, oh, yeah, it awesome. propelled the channel. Like I think I was I was probably at around the 60 or 70,000 sub mark there. Yeah. And it was starting to really go off. And then literally within the next three months, the channel was, um, I went from losing my job. I was working like part-time at the kayak shop and just, planning maybe to go full time maybe in a year or six months to a year my wife also had a casual job at the time because we were pretty flexible with kids and just trying to work on the youtube channel as well and we we both lost our jobs and just as all this happened the channel just propelled oh like, man that's up. a good story yeah so it's just luck and and like i guess i've been working at the channel for yeah, for years yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. staying up late yeah. and you know i and doing all of that thing and the dream was there at that stage, but it did it all came together literally within three months. It was it changed everything. Like it doubled the subs. Like I probably got yeah, doubled my sub count in like within a couple of months. Yeah. You got and the hockey stick. Viable. You hit the hockey stick. 
Yeah. But I it did. wasn't it wasn't an overnight success. It was many years in the making and it just happened to all come together <laughs> at the right time. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Great so just story. yeah, it was a bit of luck, but a lot of, there was work, but yeah, just it just I just got it was just perfect. Yeah. Very lucky, I guess, really. <laughs> oh, Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com, get Adam's course and use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln-dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American-made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at KillShotSpearGuns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at KillShotSpearGuns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at KillShotSpearGuns.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden gonna get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times, but there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at NoobSpearer.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. So I was going to ask what was one of my next questions was pretty much like, I mean, what kind of success have you seen from your channel? So I'm looking at you got nearly 420,000 subscribers. Uh, I can see one vid here has got 3.9 uh, million views. One's got a million views. You've got various videos over 500,000 videos uh, views. Um, is it? It's yielding an income or purely off like Google AdSense or YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, once those like if you get a big video, one big video will sort of. Uh, it's sort of snowball effects on all your past videos. So if you get one really big one that goes viral or anything, say over, or anything over a million is a really, a really great result. And then, and then all the other videos uh, prior will also get a lift. So uh, like the ads, like the, the, the most recent videos will do all the heavy lifting, but all the channels sort of basically gets a lift and it makes it, yeah, like it just through Google ads. Like I, and a lot of other guys like, like to, um, you know, sort of uh, like I and I'm, I probably wish I'd had done this more heavily, but you know, they they rely a lot more on say merch and sponsors and things like that. Ideally, in my mind, I wanted to try and just just do it just off AdSense, so I didn't have anyone to answer to. Like I just wanted to just do it off ad revenue. But uh, what I'm starting to realize with YouTube is it's just like any TV show. You've got a season or two in you, and then you, and then your show might not be very popular anymore. People lose lose interest, and unless you can keep reinventing it, which I'm trying to do all the time, I guess doing the island trips and um, and then picking up the spearing again from when I was a kid, and and starting to revisit that. That's all part of, I guess, introducing new things and reinventing yourself. But I'm starting to realize now that, you you know, like I had this really crazy run. I probably should have taken advantage of it more actually and just done like and just done exactly what YouTube wanted me to. But I, I stupidly tried to have some credibility and tried to keep doing the kayak fishing and try, keep doing all the other things that I know like originally that's what the audience were here for. But really YouTube wanted me just to do the island vids. And if I was smart, I probably should have just smashed island vids out one after the other. But one, um, one problem. Yeah, you get your run. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. One problem I have with any single source, like you, you see like, bizarrely successful TikTokers or Instagrammers or, mm. or even back in the day, like Facebook people, like if you're beholden to that platform, you're, I, and I'm not, I'm not having, I'm not being rude to you. Like, I just think no, no, no. you're, you're kind of sometimes 
um, allowing them to hold all the um, all the chips, you know, and they're just giving oh, yeah. you their their rake, you know. Um, oh, I'm absolutely right there right now because I like I'm you know when when the when the heyday sort of dies down and the channel's still going great. Like yeah, it's, yeah, it's still tracking along nice. It's still like it's the sole income for our our whole family. Oh, and, wow, and I've got kids and everything, so awesome. you know what I mean. I can't I can't afford to not get it right in a sense, and I like and so that I guess. I guess I've always had those family commitments even before the channel went well. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm used to it. And we know, you know, the family knows how to, how to run a tight ship when, you know, if things get tight and things like that. So it's all good. But yeah. um, I'm definitely realising that, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's definitely something I've got to work on to keep it going yeah. and to keep that, keep it, you know what I mean, keep it uh, current and, and relevant, that's for sure. What, one thing I think, like, you don't, I think when you're running a business that's based on a lifestyle and a passion, you want to have integrity. So you don't want to mm. just become a salesperson like, oh, I've got a captive audience. I'm just going to sell them heaps of shit now. Um, yeah. But your audience probably all share similar problems. And so mm. offering them products and services that solve some of those problems, when it's a natural fit, I think it it works well and it could go well for you. Like um, – mm. When I think of YouTube, I think you know it's hard to go past young bloods with the with the success they've had. They've gone a long time, and obviously, like now, I think it's bizarrely successful. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, he's even getting a second run now. I think it, it's um, yeah, like it, the channel is just going crazy. Yeah, because yeah. there, there was even a time I was like, oh, has he hit that that like sort of that point where he starts to decline or you're in slow decline. Yeah. But then, and just as I thought that was the case, his channel is just like the last couple of months, he's doing really well again. It's like crazy numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to perpetuate yeah. it, isn't it? Like, um, Oh, if only, yeah, <laughs> if only yeah, it was yeah. that easy. Yeah. To find that, you know, that, that success. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, man, you've done cool already. So I, I think sometimes like in anything, you have a bit of a low and then it, it's onwards and upwards again, but you seem yeah. like a bit of a data driven guy too. So a lot of people, I think sometimes they work really hard at something like, and I see this in the content creation world. And I know we're suddenly getting away from spearfishing here, but um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people make these shit hot videos or whatever, but then they don't sort of mesh them right with the audience. Like, so you're talking about mm. tuning up your thumbnails and your headlines and you're saying that's ninety percent of ranking sometimes with YouTube. You've got to get people yeah. to click on it before they watch it. Yeah. But um Yeah, yeah. But and and then I guess you once you've had one successful video, it it raises you in the ranking hierarchy and then like you said, it gets a flow on effect. Yeah. What other things yeah, have yeah. you learned apart from thumbnails and headlines? And oh, let's just go with headlines for a sec. How do you plan a headline? Mm-hmm. Oh geez, yeah. Like it, it's it's one of those things again. Like I think, yeah. I get. I guess I unfortunately recently got caught caught in the habit of just renaming things with a similar kind of title, just simply because I knew it worked. And now I've probably got to break that habit soon as well because uh, we've all like everyone in my genre has kind of done it to death. That you know, the two days solo camping, you know, deserted island. Like that's and oh, it's, it's become a bit, videos, a, yeah, it's yeah. a bit of a cliche. Yeah, it's become a bit of a cliche. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to have to like I'm going to have to rethink that. But it's it's like yeah, it's, it's dangerous to to not go with what you know as well. Sometimes like we it feels dangerous anyway. But then you'll never find that new next big viral video without sort of branching out as well and trying something different. So, but yeah, um, what else have I learned? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, like. I think, well, I think being authentic is definitely part of my success. I don't know. I can't speak for other people. You know, other, everyone goes a different route. Like yeah. a lot of people do go that, like, you know, like like that thumbnail route where there's, you know, they're more than happy to, you know, flaunt uh, all kinds of things, you know what I mean, and, and you know, and, and mock things up. I've, I've tried to go the route of just trying to be, yeah, just be authentic and a, and a down-to-earth kind of guy. And I think that's worked for me. Um when it comes to like things that could like not so much gaming it, but um, yeah, just trying to take advantage of the way YouTube, like YouTube generally, like when it comes to data, when, if I, like I'm, I've got to be, I'm glued to analytics, every video, every second of the day, I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to maximize the success. And it, it is, it is difficult because there's just so much competition. Do they give but, you um, tips? Do they say like, oh, here's like, if you're, if you're seeing like, um, You've got a massive uptake. You've got a hundred thousand people looking at a video, and then they're all dropping off at the minute twenty-five mark. 
Do you go yeah. in and re-edit that video to change that scene to try and reduce uh, that drop off? I won't re-edit it just because it's too. I think it's too risky to play around too much with it. But like, I'll definitely adjust what I do for the next video. Like, there's. I think there's definitely. Yeah, in in that sense, like capturing the audience for the first thirty seconds of uh, and just holding on to them for as long as you can during the intro of the video. I, that's definitely important. So, how do you do that? And a then, hook. Uh, a hook. It could be something simple, like you know how a lot of people would say a montage or a, like a, a like or a little clip of what's what's the the most important or most exciting part. Say if they're catching a fish or spearing a fish, they might put just before they spear it as just at the beginning as the intro, and then they'll cut it. And then they'll go into the regular story, and then they'll build up to that point again. Yeah. Just anything to get anything to get people's attention. A lot of lot of times, say music and a little montage of an overview of the whole video. You know what I mean? Or some little snippets of the video. Just or it could just be you know like a crazy intro of you talking, just really hyping it up, something like that. You know what I mean? Anything, anything basically, just keep them on for that first thirty seconds is key, definitely. And then from that point on, if you can if you can kick that, like there's a few I don't know hallmarks like that, like keeping them involved for that first little bit of the video. Uh, and then, and then, oh, there's just so many analytics that I'd like just definitely watching. Like in that first, that first hour is so important for the video for it to do well. And if it, you'll very, you'll very quickly after that first hour, get an idea of how the video is going to go. Um, like the first hour kind of dictates how many impressions it'll get fed out to from that point on. And then you get another, say at about 24 hours and 48 hours, you've got sort of these little, sort of hallmarks uh, in the analytics. And then from that point on, it's almost decided how well it's going to go and how much it will get fed out from that point on. Every now and then you get like a, a weird video that sort of it just sort of all of a sudden sparks up again, like after, say, three days of just sort of looking like it was going to be pretty dismal. <laughs> but usually it's pretty predictable. From After that first hour, I can usually know if I'm on a banger or, <laughs> or, I'm, uh, or I've got to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Do you, does your benchmark – shift is your your goalposts your you know what your measure of a successful video is is that is that a is that yeah. a forever changing game or, or are you just um do you just, like do you just take it as it comes how how do you ride that that roller coaster when it's yeah, your main like, source of income yeah well i try and take it as it comes but uh i think realistically especially when you when you like i'm in the so you, your channel typically has like you know, it's heyday or it's it's peaks and troughs and right in like uh, like a, I call it like the grinding kind of time where you've just got to get there and just grind out videos and try and find one that's actually going to going to be your next big thing. Yeah. Trying new topics as well, and it's always risky trying new topics. I've got lots of mates that do like other have other channels, and I think a thing at, at the moment is just maybe not adding too many topics in your channel because it, YouTube doesn't really know where to feed it out to. So um, that could be like a, a tip as well for a lot of guys. If you start a new channel, um, maybe not having too many topics. But that that goes against exactly like that thing I was talking about before: wanting to have integrity, wanting to be like a vlog where you can where you can have all kinds of topics that happen in life. You know, I, I like lots of things in real life, so why can't I like lots of things you know in my videos? But I think YouTube likes you to narrow it down to be you know, I, I, you're the kayak fishing guy, or you're the uh, you're the, you know, you're the spearfishing guy or, you know, unfortunately sometimes it's hard to capture all of those audiences. Yeah. Yeah. You almost want to break from it so that you, that, like after a while, I think when people get to know you, they follow your channel and they watch your videos because it's you and they don't really care mm. what you're doing. They like you, they know you, they feel yep. like you're going to deliver a, a certain level of entertainment. Stuff's going to happen and therefore they subscribe and they watch your videos. Um, and I think that loyal fan base probably, drive a lot of of what happens do you have an optimal video drop time in terms of uptake by your existing subscriber base yeah no i i, I always upload now at um well ideally if i've got content ready uh the the perfect time i've i find is um saturday morning seven o'clock so yeah wow. it's and i specifically like it's been a lot of you know years of trial and error you know and i because i've found um it's the peak time for me, and I guess it's my audience because a lot of guys have a very different opinion on this. Because say if I if I upload it uh, in an afternoon at Australia's peak time, which would be say around eight o'clock, seven or eight o'clock at night, any any day of the week really, but um, I'll get a huge amount of views from my Australian audience uh, very quickly. 
but then it'll taper off really fast and then it, the US won't pick it up. And obviously I really, what you really need to do to be successful is capture that US audience and then it, maybe there's other European countries as well. But there's, there's a handful of countries that you really need to be capturing, otherwise you're kind of not in the game eventually. And it's an interesting thing. I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong on this, but I can even even certain topics, like I've even been watching a lot of caravan, like Australian kind of caravan and touring guys and yeah. doing the lap and all of that. And they a lot of them seem to, well, some of them break through and they do really well in, and obviously catch, capture that American audience. But I, you see a lot of them get to that, you know, maybe 60 to 100,000 subs and then they sort of, they can't, they don't go further. It seems that they don't go further because I think that's such an Australian-based channel yeah and i think that's that's been key for me so with my upload time because i want to i want to capture that's the and saturday morning i'm getting u.s prime time friday night traffic and then i'm also getting australian morning saturday morning weekend traffic yep. so i found it it was the optimum time for me because then i noticed that my u.s because the u.s makes up a bit like more views than australia now it used to be all australia views but now it's turned into yeah. um you know heavily u.s Plus, and then there's lots of other countries as well. It's it's all all over the place. But yes, US would definitely be top. Then Australia, then maybe UK, Canada, and then it just goes down from there. But yeah, so that 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 time worked for me. That seven in the morning because I it seems to capture the US audience and then maintain them. And then Australia takes over by Saturday night. And then if we get a good result from both of those two that's enough to make sure that the US do pick it up again on Saturday morning. Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah. And then, and then the Australian, the Australian audience brings it all the way through to when the US starts to wake up again. <laughs> I can tell that you think deeply mm. about it. And I think that's part of what's informing no, your channel success. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's hard to turn that, it's hard to turn that analytical brain off, man. Um, mm. I was going to ask you with, we, we're stuck on YouTube. I want to get into your life yep. story and your sparing <laughs> as well. But before we sure. head out of the YouTube, We've t- we've gone straight into a veterans vault pretty much on on your YouTube channel, but um, useful tools in the YouTube suite. Um, like I see Instant Premiere. Um, you know, there's other tools that are sort of coming online uh, mm-hmm. in terms of using their um, supposedly copyright free, royalty free music and some of the shit oh, like yeah, this yeah. that yeah, people music's get. Co- tricky. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very tricky one. Walk us through. So, first of all, YouTube tools that are available for everyday YouTubers that are useful or or when you reach a certain level, when do these tools become available and things like that? Yeah, I think the music's available almost straight away, but I tend to use uh, like third-party kind of music like uh, resources, things like Epidemic Sound and, and things like that. Uh, and it's always tricky with music though. It, first of all, it takes a lot of time. Like, the, like I think I got a a lesson in a, in a content creation once, I think it was Briggsy actually, I'd spent, like I went to Fraser Island, I'd spent like a week on Fraser chasing black marlin, caught a black marlin, punched my boat, epic, epic videos. And, I, and I'd put like like weeks into editing these videos and I um, I uploaded it and it sort of did, it did fine, but it didn't do very well. And Briggsy uploaded a eight minute video of him, like just from start to finish catching a bonefish. And I think it was called like the third fastest fish in the world or something, or seventh fastest fish in the world, I think it is. Ah. And like, and that video got, I think it must've got millions of views, I think. And my videos did like, they got around the 200,000 mark and they did like, and and I'd used music, I'd used all the tricks and the, all the tricks and everything at my disposal. And like his video did so much better. It was a real lesson in what to invest time in and, and music's one of those things. Like, first of all, there's not enough good music to go around. Like you'll notice a lot of guys, you start to rehear the tracks, you know what I mean, and rehear the. And I, there's nothing worse in my mind like than hearing someone else put a video up. Like any time around when my video went up using the same track, it's like oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So um, like I I, I use music sparingly, but uh, it, like it's got a time and a place because it just definitely elevates the you know the feeling of the video. But then some people, I get a lot of people saying just no music, no music. We just want to hear the natural sounds and. They even say don't talk as much as well because I talk too much in my videos. <laughs> how do you cap- but, um, how do you capture yeah. sound? Sorry, how do you capture sound? Uh, oh, um, I like I literally make my videos with two GoPros and uh, or sometimes three and an iPhone. Like I don't have any fancy sound capture gear or it's all it's all like and I I tweak it as much as I can like post like in um 
in the editing software. Yeah. But uh, but in general, like like the wind wind is my biggest problem. But um, yeah, I, in general, I can usually get a pretty good result just literally from Hero Nines and an iPhone twelve. But but all the older videos I was using, you know, past cameras, which weren't as fancy as those. Yeah. They they've got um these go mics out by road. Um, if you ever have a yeah, look. they what? look good. I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they sync up with a GoPro. Uh, I, yeah. th- I believe the problem is like, all my stuff. I get wet. Yeah, That's the yeah. problem. It's, everything's got to be waterproof. So yeah. as soon as I plug anything in or uh, add anything, it, it becomes unwaterproof. Yeah, and and, and you want to keep yeah. it simple, eh? Yeah, that's the key, isn't it? Otherwise, I'd, yeah, like by the time I set up or do anything, I've missed whatever I was doing anyway. Yeah, it's too late. Um, you mentioned some feedback that you've got from viewers and stuff, like in terms of, uh, you know, some of them are of, of offering con- constructive criticism, which may or may not be the views that everyone else holds that watches your channel. Um, <laughs> yeah. How do you tune out the dickheads and how do you distinguish what's noise and what's actionable and what's take yeah, action yeah. on? Uh, yeah, oh, look, I'm, I'm pretty lucky in general. Like, you know, 90, 98% of the comments on my channel are very positive. Like the community that I'm lucky I've got a community that seems very positive and very like supportive Then very few dickheads basically, but there's always going to be guys out there that just like, like sometimes you get those comments that, that hit a little closer to home. Like they've, they've clearly watched the video. They've clearly made an assessment and they cut, say something that sort of does cut. And, you're like, oh, and then and then I'm more than happy to just over time I've gotten used to it for starters, but I'm more than happy to take that on board, even if they didn't say it very nicely. That's proper criticism that maybe I can get something out of. That's fine. You know, I can I can take that. But then you get the other guys that are just like they clearly just hate my guts, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> or they just don't like the look of me, you know what I mean, for whatever reason. And you and those guys, you know, they're they're, they're that's water off a duck's back. And I might even even if I'm feeling in the mood, I might even try and troll them back and have a bit of fun. <laughs> but um, but uh, in general, most most people are pretty nice, and you know, and and I even even get sometimes if someone says something that's that's actually nasty or offensive, usually other people will take care of them for me these days. Like yeah. the, the like the community will actually jump on and just and shut them down, yeah, and then I'll, and then I'll come in and I'll I'll go through an old comment and I'll see it and I'll go oh wow because like and there's like a you know, there's like 50 comments on one, like on a, on a, a throwaway comment up the top. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and uh, people have gone at it, you know, and then I'll just chime in at the end and maybe just shut it down from that point on. Or, but generally, most people are pretty good. Yeah, you've got to you've got to be able to ignore it or shut it off though, because like even the positive comments, you, you don't want to let that go to your head. Yeah. Either because it's because you know there's lots of positive comments, but the reality is I yeah. You know, yeah, people. Some people are too nice, almost. You know what I mean? I've just yeah. got to, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just got to keep it, keep it real, and, and and look at it for what it is. Sometimes, yeah. We're we're we're, we're way lost in the weeds here. It's just straight YouTube. Yeah, sorry, so, it's a no, YouTube, no, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's all good. I've, I've, I've done this as much as you. I'm scratching my own itch here today. Um, Rod, you've created, you know, dozens and dozens of videos. If not, how many videos have you created? You know. Uh, I don't know, maybe a couple of, I don't know, 200 or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I could look it up. But I think it's probably around, yeah, in the 200 kind of area, I'd say. So a person's watched 200 of your videos and then, mm. you know, they walk into BCF one day and you're all there buying a pair of undies or something. Yeah, um, BCF and I'm popular at BCF and Bunnings. I bet you, I yeah, bet you. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's my two, <laughs> that's yeah, it though. Yeah. So I can, I can <laughs> like, I can see people coming up to you um, they've watched all your videos and they feel like they know you. How do you deal mm. with that? No, it's it's weird though. The funny thing is, I I feel like I know people now as well. Like they because they just start talking, and yeah, it's always it's a bit weird. Like because I'm not, it's it's definitely not like I don't know. I'm definitely not after that kind of. Oh, I know, I know, they, I, but I but I'm 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 pretty comfortable now with it. I, it's kind of fun and funny. Like oh, oh, my cool. wife thinks it's hilarious. Like if someone like takes a photo or comes and, and says hello, you know, out of the blue, she thinks like I'm. Oh, she just calls me a loser. It's it's great. You need to do but, a um, video with yeah. the three meter flatty yeah. bloke as well, though. Yeah, oh, I've met um, William the Powerfish once uh, down at Kingscliff, and he's yeah, no, he's a cool guy. He's a funny <laughs> he's a bit, um Yeah, yeah, God knows what could happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's crazy. He's loose. Jesus. Yeah, no, definitely. Powerfish is definitely. <laughs> 
He's funny though. Like he, no, he's, he's it's very cool. Yeah, yeah, what he's done. He's definitely taken something and run with it as well. It's been an oh, interesting real great. life trolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. Like if you can't have people like that, that's willing to ha- like have a bit of a joke around as well. It's it makes it enjoyable. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Man, we've talked about YouTube and I've really enjoyed it and I've, I've been able to ask you a lot of questions that I've, I've thought about and uh, like I create content as well. So I may have made this, we may have done this interview for an audience of five, you know, the other, yeah. you know but there's, there are a lot of Spiros that have YouTube channels that want them to be successful. I think if you yeah. spend time making a video, you want people to watch it. It's natural. And um, yeah. I mean, people could go to the level that you've gone to and start making an income out of it. So it's not to be sneezed at. Yeah. If that's what you want to do, then then you might as well, you know, be the best you can and have a good serious crack at it. So it's great to cover this ground because I, th- I think a few people share a desire to do that. So it's cool. Do you like to penetrate? Great news. Penetrator Fins, today's Noob Spiro podcast sponsor, are tough as nails. Robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby spun finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anoopspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. That's right, use the code Noobspiro to save $25 on any pair of penetrator fins at penetratorfins.com. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with kill shots spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off. American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they are in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Sydney, spearfishing, who got you into it? And walk us through that. Yeah. Uh, so when I was, yeah, when I was really young, like my dad was a pretty keen spear fisherman oh, okay. and he had, uh, one or two mates, which is, um, and he's appeared in some of the videos, Mark, uh, like one of my dad's best mate, George is a, a good Greek family. They loved eating fish. And so they both go out spear fishing all the time. And, and so we just grew up around it, having like a dad, dads that were really into fishing and spear fishing. So naturally, like, I guess we just wanted to do it. So we got hand spears first and. And we're just mucking around in rock pools and, and just mucking, like just anything, you know, anything we could sort of sort of do that our dads were doing, we were into. And then I think, I think my dad, I think we, we used to go around to junk piles. Like, you know, how you, yeah, like we don't have it up here in Queensland, but down in Sydney, there's like tip, tip day or tip week and everyone on junk week and everyone throws all their junk out on the street yeah. and then it gets collected. We used yeah, to we go have. and like ride around the, yeah. yeah, ride around the neighborhood and try and find spear gun parts. Oh, wow. Eventually, I think I got my dad to buy me. Oh, my first gun was like a little, you know, those little sea hornet, yeah. like nine, like tiny little gun. And I think he told me, he said when, because I was thinking I was a bit young to have it, but it was, it was, it was too hard for me to pull the rubbers back. And he said, when I can pull the rubbers back is when I can use it by myself. I think that was that was the advice, or that was the rule. And it took me, I think it took me like at least a year or so before I could do it as well. And that was my first gun. It was tiny, and it like you literally you'd shoot it, and it'd just like straight down, <laughs> like into the sand. It was pretty, it was pretty pathetic. <laughs> and then I think we pulled it apart. Me and Mark, my mate, we we'd go yeah around in the junk piles, find um par- other parts of spear guns or anything we could find, and we we basically try and make better guns. And so we upgraded that little sea on it into like um probably probably about a meter meter size gun. Oh wow! And then eventually we, yeah, eventually we just, well, yeah, we get our aluminium and plug the ends and, and make it into a big gun, and find a shaft or buy a shaft, and um, yeah, and just slowly upgrade over time. Eventually, we had some pretty, pretty average gear, but what we thought was pretty good, yeah. and uh, or good at the time. But yeah, uh, yeah. And then so we just, we yeah, we just spear lots in the harbour, like everywhere from Rose Bay all the way around to like Camp Cove and on the outside of South Head. Oh. And then some other places like was it I think is was it Diamond Diamond Bay and and further down towards yeah Low Line Bay M- M- Malabar kind of area or Maroubra yeah, and then right. all the way down to probably about Little Bay wow yeah 
And then, um, but main, most of the time in the harbour and, you know, everything like from octopus, leather jacket, we'd even just, we even just went, because we, like, because we were just so young and new, new to it all, we only got gloves after a few years. We got <laughs> gloves. We, did, we figured out gloves were really good to have to grab stuff. And we would catch, like, get, catch leather jacket, like, you know, just with the gloves, yeah, you know, yeah. just press them up against the walls and stuff and things like that. So, uh, yeah, we had good times like that. And then. We had like oh, we had one thing that we used to do, which was really cool. Um, every Christmas morning, uh, we'd get the dads to take us out in the boat, and we'd just hit all the wharves, and we'd go spearing. But we'd also dive under the wharves. You can't really do it these days because the ferries all sort of come in really hot, you know, and it's a bit dangerous. But you'd you come in, you'd basically go in and just look for sunglasses and wallets and, <laughs> and things under under all the wharves, and then yeah. maybe spear a brim or something as well. Yeah. And that, that was really fun. But, yeah, we spent, like, yeah, my, most of my, my young years, all the way up to about teenage years, like, basically just getting dropped off down at the harbour somewhere. And then we'd just go spearing, uh, build cubbies, just, yeah, just running up and down the rocks there. That's awesome. And then I think I lost, yeah, I think I lost, um, for, once I got to my 20s, I think I'd, I started to lose, the t- like, the, uh, the the thirst for fishing only and spear fishing. Just, you know, just started working and studying and things like that. So I kind of lost it for a while. And then it was quite a long time, actually, until I really picked it up again. And then once I moved up to the Gold Coast, that's when it really kicked in again. Because, And I think it's just because of the outdoor kind of underwater lifestyle up here and such a beachy water, you know, uh, waterman kind of lifestyle that it all really kicked in. And then I couldn't believe the fish they were getting up here, so then it really kicked in. <laughs> so you're in the Goldie now? Yeah, just on uh, uh, Burley Heads. Yeah, yeah a beautiful part and, uh, of the world. Yeah, it's nice. Like I originally, when I moved up here, I moved into like the thicker surface, and that that was oh. fun for a while. But then I realised the the best, well, arguably the best part of the Gold Coast is you know from Burley down, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Down to the mm. down to the water, and even beyond, yeah. it's it's still nice. Down yeah, there. in that southern like northern New South Wales, and yeah, yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Mm. But really good diving too, particularly offshore. Have you started to make friends with boats and get out wider and chase some of the? Stuff out. I I do make friends with people, and I I do get offers, especially recently. Now that spearing is becoming a bit more part of the channel, and then I'm only really doing shallow stuff because because uh, obviously because it's solo, I'd like to keep it really as safe as possible. It's funny because when I was younger, I did I didn't even heard of shallow water blackout or anything. I hadn't even it didn't even cross my mind. I'd never even heard of it. But now now that I look more into it, and I've got a family that I'm obviously trying to keep it as safe as possible. But like yeah, I get lots of guys um sort of offer and I should take them up on it. I've got one or two guys that come to mind that are, that are actually very good Spiros and they live just around the corner and, um, and they've offered to take me. And I, I, I think I'm just nervous about being a liability or just not being, you know, able to keep up. So they, it stops me from doing it. When I, when I, what I really do want to do is jump in the, jump in, say off the kayak or off a boat and get like a big mackerel or, you know what I mean? Jump in at the fads. Like it all seems very doable, but I, I can't do it by myself. So, yeah. I probably, you know, probably should take them up on the offer. Yeah. Yeah. I, one thing you could do is um, if you wanted to get a bit of confidence in your freediving ability, there's a group down there, the Gold mm. Coast Freedivers, and they train out of one of the swimming pools down there. And it's good yeah. to meet a bunch of Spiros, but it's also good to sort of um, see what you, you can do in a controlled environment. And then mm. when you get offshore, you've got, you've got to equalize and you've got to deal with topside conditions, but you're used to all that already. So yeah, it'll just yeah. be you'll it'll give you a, a greater level of comfort and and co- confidence I think so I'd encourage you to do yeah. that. Yeah, I should I should do it. And like I think I was listening to one of the other podcasts and someone said that unless you start going with someone else, it's really hard to to progress and and because you you can't push yourself or you, it's safe not to <laughs> like yeah. So yeah, like to, if I really want to get better. I need to actually, yeah, commit to going with other people so I can actually, you know, experiment and do more, yeah. There's plenty of good reef around down there, sort of that 30-foot, 40-foot mark. Um, you know, yeah, there's plenty of good diving down there. And um, mm. it's a really interesting part of the world too because you've got a hardcore mix there of like southern temperate species and uh, and some of the subtropical stuff as well, so. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't believe it. When I, when I got up here, I couldn't believe so like the, the variety and, and what people can get. Yeah, it's crazy. So mackerel are, are an awesome fish. Have you come across one with the spear yet? Uh, I, not, a, not a Spanish. I've seen um, like uh, doggies yeah. cruising around, yeah, so dog mackerel. But I'm, I'm, 
And I've seen like Mac Tuna and a couple of other things like zipping in and out, but I've not seen like a big Spanish come up near me yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Like probably the biggest kind of or the closest thing like that that I've seen in speed is oh yeah we dropped we dropped that for yeah speed. we dropped out for a sec there sorry about that yeah no. <laughs> that's all right. uh, did you mean yeah, did, the, did you oh, mean sorry. the shark mackerel the yellow ones uh, no no I think they were doggies like oh. slight you know the bigger spots the small small ones what would you call them school mackerel I guess yeah, would be another name for them. yeah 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 basically like a small a smaller mackerel like smaller than a spotty yeah. Yeah, and cool. I've seen them zip around, especially up at the islands. I see them zip around sometimes. I'd like to get my hands on one or my spear into one, but they, they seem to. They've, oh, it's only been fleeting, so yeah. But um, I've just been getting my fill of just other things, like things that I never thought I'd get my chance to spear, like a coral trout. Like I back when I was uh, younger, like that was a fish you'd only dream of in Sydney, and yeah. now up here, you know, they're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, they <laughs> are a bit further north, yeah. yeah. Like where, you, mm. where you're heading up there. Oh yeah, a bit north. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you're still getting away for missions up there fairly regularly or? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's so, like I'm lucky to be able to sort of, uh, cause it's, I, ha- I have to go for the, for my job now, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. So like much to my wife's like, like she just roll her eyes, but yeah, no, like I, like it's definitely become such a part of the channel that I, I, I regularly kind of try and get up there. I'm always like, I, all I do basically now is scour weather channels and yep. weather uh, weather sites, and um, any anywhere the weather's good, whether it's up or down the coast, is is where I want to head. And it's just oh, this season has been impossible to deal with, but um, just anywhere that has good weather is is on the cards. So if the if the islands are good, then I'll I'll dedicate maybe three or four days at least and, and try and get up there and make some videos and have some fun. Yeah, and like it's yeah, it's great. It's I'm very lucky to be able to do that. Yeah. Have you done any collabs with anyone else? Uh, yeah, more fishing based. I've done a few. Uh, well, not not recently, but I've I've definitely worked like. Well, when we, when I was a smaller channel, I remember Timmy Turtle. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was fishing yeah. with Timmy Turtle. He's uh, another like a YouTuber that was sort of busting out on the scene in a similar size channel. We did some good collabs in the beginning. Okay. He had like that pipe raft. It was basically like a he'd made like a raft out of like uh, big plumbing PVC pipes, and he was just fishing the canals in that. And he wanted to get it offshore, so I thought I go, I go offshore all the time on a kayak. I could help him with that. So we basically pushed him in through the waves offshore once, and he got out there and was catching like some. He caught like some spotties and some. Oh, like that's cool. So it was pretty good. But yeah, I've done a few other things. Like I've, I've fished with a, a few other guys, you know, like um that you'd see around, like Brooksy and that. Not for a while, not for a while though, actually. And I think Andy's fishing. I did one with him for a while. this is a while back though. Yeah, yeah cool. Recently, it's a lot of solo missions, actually. Yeah. So with your spearing these days, um, what are you? Yeah. What What are kind of your you know sort of top two or three obstacles to, I mean, getting better at it? I think it all hinges on because I feel like uh, just all the time being like doing it from when I was young and like you said, just being comfortable in the water, it, that all adds up to like I still manage to get fish even though my breath hold isn't that great, you know. Mm. I think so I think stalking and and um, just mucking around in sort of, you know, anything under say around, like around, like I very rarely, especially on the islands by myself, go deeper than say five metres. Mm. Like and then, you know, I can I think I could go a fair bit deeper but I, I don't because I – like for, there's a few things holding it back, and if I had a friend there, I probably would. You know what I mean? Like, and sometimes yeah, like sometimes it, you yeah. don't need it. You can have plenty of fun in five mm. meters of water. So yeah, I still managed to get some. You know, yeah, like, yeah. but it is yeah, it is a bit sad. So I think um, I think uh, I think that's the key. I think I just need to be with someone that would actually allow me to be more confident in going deeper and knowing that someone's at least around <laughs> with me. You know, and then I think, um, and then it'd just be more and more time in the water. I guess you know, obviously practicing, like you said, you know, in a in a controlled environment, and just seeing how far. Because I don't think I've ever even, I don't think I've ever actually pushed myself to see how far I can actually go at the moment either. So I don't even know what my, I don't even know what my point is at the moment, or what, what my sort of, I don't even know where I'm at. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't even really matter f- for spearing, but I think it's sometimes it's just nice to have an understanding of your body at a greater level. And when you're in a controlled environment and you get to do that, like as long as you don't try and replicate that in the ocean when you go and spearfishing. But it, it, yeah. it does give you at least some ideas about, you know, where you're at and what you're capable of. And, you know, 
I mean, obviously what you're doing now is just, just fine. You're getting fish, you're having fun. That's all you needed to worry about. So it's not it's not like it's not like we all have to aspire to some high level of performance. The objective is just yeah. to have fun and to put fish on the table for everyone. And in your case, make cool videos. So yeah, yeah, yeah true. And but I've got to admit though, it, like I guess it's part of just wanting to you know wanting to improve and 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 maybe get some of those species that are sort of off, off the cards for me at the moment. Yeah, I guess even just with being just someone, I guess there's no reason why I couldn't jump in and you know, in mackerel season and get one. But I I definitely need to be with someone, you know what I mean, to, to then do it. So, yeah, no, but I think, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to keep improving though. Yeah. But, yeah, no. But, yeah, we still managed to get a few. <laughs> yeah, awesome, man. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what about scary stuff? Have you ever have you ever had any moments out there where you were legitimately afraid for your safety? And uh, if so, yeah. what did you learn from it? Yeah. Legitimately afraid? I don't know about legitimate. Like, not not – not really. Like, I don't think I've had any, like, you know, like serious, serious events. I don't know. One that stands out actually is like, I remember diving under some wharves. We were doing that, that thing where we go and try and, you know, find things under wharves when I was younger. And I remember looking up and I'd, you know, done the dive and had a bit of a muck around. And then I looked up and went, yeah, sweet. And went to surface. And um, I'd obviously gone under, you know, how the wharves go down in steps. Yeah. And then I was actually under part of the wharf that had come down and it was just sitting like the surface of the water looked clear, but it was actually, the wharf was actually only maybe a few centimetres above the waterline. Oh, wow. So I've looked up and I've gone, oh, sweet, let's go up. And I've come up and I've smashed my head onto the Ooh. onto the actual boards of the wharf. <laughs> and then obviously I was out of breath as well. So I was like gone and looked around for like the nearest kind of exit. And I think I just had to swim straight out, out away from the wharf and, and find this sort of the end of it. Yeah. So that was, I guess, a bit scary. And, and it made me think, Geez, yeah, let's not get that wrong again. Always look up and be careful. I actually, a lot of the time now I come up with my <laughs> under walls, like I have my hand above me. Yeah, yeah. Even, even to this day. But, yeah, like things like that have happened. But I don't know if I've had a, an event like where I really genuinely feared, like for my life or anything or, you know, or, but uh, so I'm lucky in that regards, yeah. Um, heading offshore on a single-man apparatus, 13 kilometres though, uh, if a motor yeah. dies or something like that, it's a long paddle. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. How we go further now? Yeah, as well. So, um, but I've I've got a slightly bigger boat now. Oh, it's not that big. It's like a four meter inflatable boat, but it's much more stable. And I feel like if as long as I slow down, I'll bounce over most stuff. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely got its challenges because it's still a pretty small boat. And um, yeah, it just all comes down to reading the weather, I think, and just and just knowing when to just stay put. I think. But uh, that's I really enjoy that part of it. Is, is like the challenge of getting there, and so a lot of yeah, like a lot of people would say, just get a bigger boat, or you know, you're being foolish. But even with this sailboat, I've bought like a sailboat recently, and the people are saying you're going to have to take lessons, you're going to have to do a lot more. And and I agree, but I was like, yeah, but that's it's sort of part of the adventure, isn't it? Just I want to just get out there and start mucking around. Obviously, I'm being care- as careful as I can. But there still has to be some level of adventure, as of adventure as well, and just get out there and, and give it a crack. Yeah, sure. Mm. Are there some good like sailing YouTube channels that teach you a bit about how to sail? Yeah, yeah. No, there's lots of them there. Obviously, there's a couple of big ones that you're more like lifestyle kind of things these days. But um, yeah, no, there's lots of guys out there that just like if you just want sailing lessons, there's heaps of like like tutorials and things. And that I've I've watched I've watched lots of them, <laughs> like hundreds and hundreds. But, um, yeah, and then it's just about getting out there and practicing it and, and hopefully, yeah, and then, then just, and then it's just weather. You just got to watch the weather, yeah. So getting the kids into spearfishing and the fishing lifestyle, has that already taken place? How old are they? Yeah, I'd say the oldest is uh, 11, about to turn 12, and the youngest is uh, just turned six. So wow. um, they're, both, oh, they're both into fishing. The youngest is red hot on fishing at the moment. Like oh, you wow. can't stop him. So it's 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 good and bad because I just spend my like weekends just baiting hawks and just <laughs> basically just keeping him in the keeping his bait in the water. Yeah. But the older one, Dash, he's um he's actually when it comes to free diving or just snorkeling and mucking around, he's he's definitely got the bug. He's less into fishing, but he's more into um like grabbing the snorkel and going for a dive, you know, up and down the break wall, and and he'll he'll gladly dive down with me and hang on the bottom and and, yeah, awesome. and he, he gets it he's into it yeah so he's he's the he's the guy like so far for for, for spear fishing but we'll see you know that tweed river mouth is phenomenal for a snorkel isn't it 
Yeah. No, I've done that around that, that those break walls before. This, yeah. You can see lots of stuff when yeah. it's clear. Yeah, when it's <laughs> yeah, clean, yeah. Like it's amazing. Yeah. Even like we went to Tullabudra once when this was – a couple of years back when it was really crystal clear and we saw all kinds of things like little banded shrimp i even saw a uh, a cray like a small cray there like yeah. there's, there's surprising like what was there and you sort of yeah i just you don't expect it bit of a yeah. nursery for a lot of species i guess mm, yeah but then you go there then like the week after and the ties are changed the sand's pushed around and then half the half the spots we saw that were half covered up so just it's always changing yeah yeah that's rivers in general isn't it yeah Equalising problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the, either the Friends or an Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalisation course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends. And to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better, and some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Shrek, my dude. You're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on frosts on the spearing life, and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many newers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at SpearingMagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, newers can get an international subscription here at SpearingMagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face apparel or get a subscription to the world's greatest Spearing Magazine. Check it out at SpearingMagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. What about equipment these days? What are you using for equipment? Are you sponsored by anyone? Have you are you spruiking uh, any I'm gear? I'm not sponsored. I'm like fishing reels and things. I am, but but spear fishing gear. No, I'm just I'm I'm almost as agricultural and as as hopeless as I was when I was a kid. I guess like I was listening <laughs> to some of the list of when of some of the other podcasts you've done. I was like, oh my god, what am I going to say? Like, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Look, I, I, you know, I, I, like for me, you know, I think I was using like, yeah, Sea Hornets and Underseas guns and they've, they've definitely by far been superseded these days. Just, um, just a little. Uh, but yeah, so what, I, what I've got now is I, I literally went and bought my first rail gun, which was like, was like the Morton from Adreno. Oh, yeah. I think it's the more, yeah. And it, it, look, it works. It's definitely more accurate than what I had and I still seem to be able to hit fish with it. So that's what I've got. I've got a reel on it, but I took it off for now just because I'm just not like in a position to, you know, I'm not really using it as such. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I, I, I did, I treated myself to, cause I had some old plastic fins and, uh, I thought, no, no, if I'm going to do this more, I might as well get a decent pair of fins. So I've got like some, some like, like C4, like carbon fins, which are very fancy, Nice. <laughs> way fancier than probably I can justify, but I figured I'm going to have them for years and I'll, I'll, yeah. you know, I'll give them a good going over. So a bit of, that's all right. A good a good set of fins is a bit like a, a safety equipment as well. You could you can arguably mm. tell your wife that. Yeah, no, no, that, yeah. No, if you get caught in current, yeah. you you really appreciate a good set of fins. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I do I do feel the difference. They are very nice to use, but they're you know they obviously outstrip my my skill level at the moment. But but it's all right. Did you use the yeah, uh, the yeah. no, the Noob Spiro discount code when you went into Adreno? I didn't. I was, oh. I was, I was, I was, yeah, like I said before, I was a bit. I, I, I've only cottoned onto this new spirit podcast recently, <laughs> and now I'm, I'm all in though on these long drives. I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm covering lots of ground. I've, I listened to like the, I literally got back from an island trip like three days ago, and I must have listened to at least six or seven. Oh wow, new spirit is on the way. Well, yeah. You've only got like but, 190 uh, to go or something. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but I'll, I'll get through them. Yeah, it's no. great. I can't. I can't. I don't know how I was doing drives before podcasts. They're mm. just the best thing ever. Yeah, oh, I was going to say, is. like, we were talking earlier about comments and stuff. I listen to Joe Rogan podcast a fair bit, especially when yeah. I've got time and, and, and long drives. So I listen to quite a yeah. few different podcasts. Like, that's partly why I have a podcast because I love them so much. And um, yeah. he talked about comments as well. And he, like, his channel is so big that he just, Completely dis- post, disregards post and ghost, them. I think is his comment. Yeah, post yeah. and ghost. Yeah, <laughs> post and ghost. Yeah, oh, and it'll I, destroy you. It'll destroy you. Yeah. Man. and he's like his topics are you know often, controversial. Often, you know, highly charged. So yeah, you can imagine the kind of people that would throw you know anything's on the table in those comments. Yeah, the wild west. 
Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad he has the big conversations. And um, like, if nothing else, like it just teaches people to just be a little less attached to their ideas because that's all they really are, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. No, anyway. no, no, no. But I think he's like, well, yeah, Joe Rogan probably definitely the, the highest. That's he's the guy I listen to the most. And they're so they're so long form that I can whack one on. And it's like three or four, three hours. Oh, you know, so, ha- haven't you yeah. started? You haven't started speeding up the playback. No. Oh, that's, oh. yeah. Okay. Good. Point. You just start creeping I've not, up. I've the, not done it. Yeah. I just start creeping up the speed these days. I listen to everything on like two, two point five, sometimes even three. Times the normal speed, right? yeah, because that doesn't chipmunk. They've built something in to make the sound all nice and balanced. And as long as they don't have out there accents and the sound quality is clean, is that great to it's listen actually to? Just like, is that right? Okay, yeah. oh, I'll give it a go. Yeah, yeah, I listen I've to seen that. I saw it even on your point, it had like the two times button or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, bump it up a bit. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and audio books <laughs> are the same, like when you want to get through a good book. Um, mm. But yeah, it means you can get through a three-hour podcast in one hour with, uh, you know, and a one-hour drive is pretty standard these days. So, but yeah. 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 I like the long-form yeah. conversations. It's good. <laughs> but I also like watching good YouTube videos. So um, it looks like I've got plenty there to digest on your channel um, <laughs> and and head off with you. I think one thing I get, the sense I get from your channel is just that vicarious sort of sense of going through something as if it's almost like you doing it, you know. And uh, mm. it's a cool yep. concept, I think, because a lot of people are looking for this sort of escape. So Yeah. It's surprising how many people actually make that comment or a comment like that, just saying that I use this to – like I used to even think it was almost like a – like so people write something like, oh, I use your videos to fall asleep to, or – yeah, and you sort of think, oh, well, that's not good. But then I think they, people are a lot of the time watching either to, yeah, feel like they're actually doing what I'm doing. Or yep. they use it to relax. They mm. want to. They want to relax, and because generally, like I'm, I'm usually speaking just like I'm speaking now. It's usually, it's not usually over the top, so they can just enjoy sounds like natural sounds. Enjoy like a, just a relaxing kind of thing that people like doing. It's almost their getaway if they live in the city or they can't actually get away into the into the outdoors yeah, as well. much. They they use it and they they'll fall asleep to it and things like that. They'll just watch and then just and just chill. Yeah, it's cool, and it's yeah. promoting that lifestyle that we all know and love. So we're going to head into the, the the final round of questions. It's called Spiro Q and A. Before that, I wanted to tell people where they can find you. So it's Rocket Kit, which is R O K K I T K I T. Um, if people want to go to today's show notes, it's noobspiro.com forward slash R O K K I T K I T, and check out uh, check out Rod's channel Rocket Kit on um, on YouTube and Instagram. Come come and follow him along. Help him rank in YouTube and make sure there's decent content there ranking for everyone. Um, I, I love what you're doing, man, so please keep doing it. Spiro q and if you um, had to start spearfishing all over again, would you do anything differently and, and what would it be? Ooh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd probably – well, you know what? I, pro- I just wish I didn't stop. I wish I didn't – like after – once I was – because I think I could hold my breath longer when I was a kid than I can now. If I – Probably you just kept kept in contact with it from you know those maybe from twenty all the way up through now. I know I'd I'm sure I would have been uh, a little bit better and enjoying it even more. So yeah, maybe just don't stop. Yeah. What is the spearfishing destination you would most like to go to? Oh, uh, there's a lot uh, after listening to all the podcasts recently. There's like that Vanuatu one, oh. crazy. <laughs> but yeah. but that might be a bit out of my league at the moment. So I, I I could see myself going back to New Zealand. I've got some relatives up top there as well, and even where I went fishing last, I think I'd jump in the water right up at Spirits Bay this time and 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 have a crack at a kingfish. Like I'm sure I could do that. So some of the, that's then that's achievable for me. So big kingfish up there or a snapper, yeah, New Zealand. I was going to say, um, who has been the most influential person in your spearfishing? I was guessing it was you were going to say your dad, maybe. Yeah, I'd say it would be my dad for sure, especially in those early years, just getting me into it for sure, yeah. When, having kids yourself, um, yeah. it makes you proud that you, your dad, even though you, your, dad, your dad knows the risks of what they're putting you into, they still allow yeah. you to do it, even though it's, you know, they have that protective instinct, you know? But they let yeah, they let yeah. life happen to you anyway. It gives you a profound sense of appreciation when you become a father yourself. I think. No, definitely, and I yeah, like obviously, I 
I don't want to push my boys to do anything in particular, but I'm, I want to all be there for them if they mm. have an interest. Yeah. And, uh, like, yeah, I really do hope they have an interest because I want them to die. <laughs> I need some fishing buddies. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, no, I think uh, – I guess I'd, I'd take the exact same approach. You know, there, there's obviously risk involved in all of those activities, even just them going, you know, traveling overseas or doing – or there's any number of things they could do that involve some kind of risk. But they've got to figure that out, you know what I mean? They've got to figure it out and navigate it themselves. And spearfishing is no different. And and it would be disappointing if they didn't do all those great things. So, yeah, yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully they get into it, yeah. Yeah. Last question. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you? In uh, one sentence. Oh, yeah. Look, just, just, it's just. I think in my mind, and it, it just goes for the fishing, and 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 that's why I always try and make good meals with all the fish that I cook and things. I guess it's just in one sentence to just be. This is the way life was meant to be. It's a, it's an escape, and it allows me to do what I think we were meant to be doing, like which is just like hunt and gather, and just yeah. There's something special about getting a fish and connecting and, uh, with the feeding nature. to the family, and that's I think. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. This is a lot more than one sentence. <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. In one sentence, just the way it was meant to. That's that's yeah. why I deliberately do it. It's it's a hard yeah. one to answer, <laughs> but it's a good one to finish on because it it forces people to think succinctly about what it is that they really love about it. Um, Rodney Rocket Kit on YouTube, on Instagram, are you everywhere else as well? Snapchat, yeah, and all yeah, the trendy Instagram, stuff. Facebook, but the, the real show, I guess, is YouTube. Yep. YouTube or Instagram is the one I'm, you know, the, the two I focus on really. But YouTube's really there where it, where it's all happening, I think. Awesome. <laughs> Mate, awesome chatting with you today. Had an absolute blast. And um, I'm super stoked I got to pick your brain on YouTube. I think, um, I, I hope a lot of listeners enjoyed it and, uh, and and got to learn a little bit about the man behind the uh, the YouTube channel. <laughs> Cheers. No, thanks for having me on. And sorry if it is a bit too... Heavily YouTube based. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. We got to get out for a spear though now because you're only an hour away from me or an hour and a bit. So we'll have to get Mate, out. Just let me know. Yeah. Right. Like I said, I need, I need, I need some experienced guys to take me out. All right. I'm keen. <laughs> All right. Catch you, Rod. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed uh, my chat with Rod today. Really enjoyed listening to him and how he grew that huge youtube channel 421,000 subscribers check it out rocket kit on youtube cool dude and really good to catch up and get to meet him he's only an hour and a half south of me so i'm gonna to have to get in and uh, meet him catch up with him in person as well and get out for a dive with him hey in two weeks time we're off to chat with kevin glenn uh forrest galante put me onto this bloke very interesting very insightful dude very crazy different conversation that we had i really enjoyed it he's the owner operator of mantis spearfishing but he's far more than that he's a very interesting cat living in sort of the san diego area and uh, i had an absolute blast if you don't already by the way subscribe to the noob spiro podcast keep telling your mates about it it's helping to grow the show consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash noob spiro join 52 other legends powering the show on an episode by episode basis guys the start of july i'm headed down to sydney and for a week-long adventure, and I'm going to interview some awesome people along the way. That is powered by Patreon listeners just like you. Check it out, patreon.com forward slash newspira. That's me for this week. But come back in two, Kevin Glenn from Mantis Spearfishing. Thanks for listening, guys. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price beat guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The NoobSpear podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with neptonics.com it's solid gear that works equipment you can rely on it's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear particularly in the u.s they got free shipping on all orders over 99 dollars in the u.s furthermore you can use the code noob10 to save 10 percent off on your entire shopping basket at neptonics.com use the code noob neptonics.com 